What's the difference between being a leader or leading a team? Now, most of you will say, Glenn, they're exactly the same thing, but I'm gonna challenge your thinking today with the conversation I have with Mike DeRazio. He's the owner operator of the Platinum Auto Group around this topic because his take is that anyone can lead a team because they're put in charge, they're given a title, and by nature, people will have to follow them. But are they really leading them in the right direction? Are they a good leader or are people just following the title? So I asked Mike, what makes a good leader? What are the aspects of a leader? And that led into other conversations about building a team and growing a business. But at the core, what makes a great leader? fascinating conversation. I can't wait for you to hear it. So let's dive into today's episode of You're in Charge, Now What? with Mike DeRazio. All right, Mike, thank you for joining me. Let's just dive right in. I you know, I met you maybe about a little over a year, year and a half ago. And one of the things that always stood out for me listening to you and talking to you is your sense of your you you seem pretty grounded in your sense of leadership you've been also very open about your journey you know obstacles you've overcome so when you think of new leaders someone who's in a position of leadership let's start with what traits do you look for in people to say i can empower you to take on this project yeah, I mean, first, the, the first thing I'm looking for in any individual is just what are their values. So I'm going to try to talk to them and, and fig, really figure out what those values are. And then I'm going to dig a little deeper and try to figure out if they really have the, the character to execute the, those values, right? Mm. And then thirdly, um, what I always think about with people, okay, if, if you have the right values and I'm looking for in an individual, and I feel like you have the character to execute those, uh, those, the, those values. Then the third thing is, do you have the integrity <laughs> to, to do it when no one's around? So can I leave you alone? And that, and that was something that I had to evolve into that thought process because early on in my career, I tried to do everything myself. But if I can't have the trust in someone that they have the integrity to execute on a consistent basis, the values that we agree upon, then they're not the right person for me. So those are the things I try to identify early on with something. And and then all my interview processes, you know, even down, you know, service technicians, the whole office personnel, I mean, anyone that comes into the company, I always do the final interview. And that's what I'm trying to assess. I'm trying to assess, do our values align? I mean, you can have good values, and they just don't align with, with mine, right. right? And do I really, by talking to you and going through your history, can I figure out, do you have that character that I'm looking for to execute those values, right? And have you had a track record of consistently um, executing those values? And then, you know, the whole integrity part, that's, that's a trust issue with me. And that's something that we need to build on. But if the, if the basis is there, I'm probably going to give you the job. And then I'm going to build that relationship and make sure that we have trust both ways, not just, not just me trusting you or me trusting the employee, but I want the employee to trust me and my consistency. I want them to see my values, my consistency of execution, my integrity that I'm still working and I'm still doing all the things I say I'm going to do when people aren't looking. I'm still doing all that stuff. So that trust goes both ways. Yeah. That uh, what I, I there's so much in that, uh, and yeah. we'll unpack some of that. But w- just what you said at the end, and I and, and I think this is a good follow up to that is this idea of you're holding yourself accountable to set that that standard, right? right? A lot of times, I think we tell people what we want them to do, and we hold them accountable. But there still is that attitude out there of do as I say, not as I do. Right. So. How do you hold yourself accountable to that? You know, if you're saying, well, I do what I say I'm going to do. Is there someone around you that you've surrounded yourself with that that helps hold you accountable? Is it yourself that's holding yourself accountable? How does that function? You know, most of the time I hold myself accountable. And, you know, maybe it's my background in the Marine Corps and and the, the way I came up, but, you know, if, if I, if I say I'm going to do something, 
you know, I, I'm going to execute it. You know, I'm going to mm. follow through. You know, I find myself, which is funny, I, I sometimes like I feel like I'm running late to work. Right. So this is an example of I'm the owner. You know, no one's going to get on me for being late ever. I could be an hour late, an hour and a half. But I really put pressure on myself that I'm running late for work. And right. sometimes I'll sit there and I'm running late and I'm brushing my teeth or whatever and getting ready. And I'm thinking, well, who's going to come down? Like there's there's no hammer that's going to fall on me for being late. But I think it, it's something that you have to instill in yourself, you know. And, you know, when you're expecting that from other people, it's just like any other relationship. If I'm expecting you to have the right values and you to have the right character and you to have integrity, and then I don't come through in that, that's like a marriage that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at me in that same respect. Well, you know, I want you looking back. I want to have, you know, maybe better values, maybe better character. I'm striving for that. I'm not saying I do have that, but I'm striving to show you better values, better character, better integrity. So I want to give you something to aspire to. And if I can't, you know, you know, portray that in my everyday actions, that it's just not going to work. It's just like a husband and wife, you know, I can't expect you to do this, you to do this, you do this. And I just do nothing. I sit on the couch, eat Doritos and I don't do anything. So, you know, it's just like any other relationship. So I think that's, that's what holds me accountable. I'm, I put a lot of value on the way I'm perceived also from, from an employee mm. standpoint, right? Because I came up through the ranks you know I, I went in for a detailer job started as sales and i came up through the ranks and i saw those <clears throat> those leaders and sales managers that when you're when you're cleaning snow off of cars and they're telling you well get all that get that and they're sitting in there sipping their coffee and they're not walking the walk they're telling you what you need to do right they're not willing to do it and, and you know, anyone that works for me they'll tell you cleaning car you know cleaning snow off of cars i'm right beside them I'm like, let's go. We're doing this. You know, it's right. leading, it's just leading from the front, you know? No, and I, I think thing. that's important. And, and again, there, there are different philosophies of the, of management, but I love right. that. And, and I'm very similar in, I hate being late for anything. Right. Uh, it just bothers me. Yeah. And I feel great pressure on. I'm almost embarrassed if I'm late. I'm very exactly. apologetic. And I've had people say, but you're the boss. And they said, it doesn't matter. Um, I was just having this conversation with, I think, some of your team when we were down uh, at a, a recent conference. Yeah. And I said, the way I try to always think through for my team is if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for them. Meaning if I can take my child in the middle of the day to a doctor's appointment, well, they should be able to as well. And it, when I say that to people, they look at me as I have 18 heads, like that's the most, that's great, but that doesn't exist. But I think to your point is the more that you are holding yourself accountable. And I love the word you use it allows other people to rise to the occasion because they don't want to disappoint you because you're holding yourself to such a high standard. Right. Um, it's that idea of not fearing you. I will, I will probably hazard a guess that if I talk to your staff, they're more afraid of disappointing you than yeah. you getting mad at them. Would that's that what I, that, that, that's, that's what I hear. And um, my wife will always say, I'll just say like, they're just afraid of disappointing you, Mike. You know? Right. And I look at it like this, you know, there, there's, and we, this has been said a million different ways, but there's, there's a difference between leading the way mm -hmm. and being a leader, right? Right. So leading the way, I, anybody can lead the way. I can give you a title and say, hey, you're going to lead the way. And the people following you don't necessarily know why you're leading the way, or they don't respect that you're leading the way. And you might actually be leading them in the wrong direction, right? Right. So, so being a leader is just other people that have that faith in you. And it goes back to my military background. You know, when you look at a platoon of individuals and, you know, one guy's in charge of that platoon, right? But if you really dig into that group of 10 or 12 people in that platoon, the platoon sees themselves as equals. The one's just a little notch above, and he'd been given that opportunity to lead. But there's mutual trust throughout right. the entire platoon. And if that leader were to fall, there's such a trust factor amongst the other members of that platoon that somebody else could easily step up. And that trust of leadership and that respect of that leadership and knowing that you're going in the right direction 
that's the difference between leading the way and being a leader, right? And, and I, I consider myself, and I've said this in meetings before, you know, I'm just the, the one individual in this organization that has been notched up to, 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 be, to be speaking these words and to be given our direction, but I don't consider myself, I never consider myself at a higher echelon than everyone else that works for me. And, you know, and I think treating the, 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 the detail guy and the, and the mechanic and the salesperson and everyone in that organization equally, they all get the same Mike DeRazio. They get the same Mike DeRazio as the guy coming in from the floor plan company wanting to offer me $20 million in floor plan. It's always the same guy. It's always the same level of respect. It's always the same empathy that's coming out from me to right. you, whoever you might be. And that's what I think creates a good environment for everybody. Yeah. And, and just off what you said, and I hope the audience really catches on to what you said, because what I heard was, you know, leading the way someone could be given the title leading way you're, you're following the title. You're not following the person, right? right. So you're following yeah. whatever they say, because they're called a manager. They have their manager shirt on, whether I like right. you or not, I have to follow you because you're the manager. I'm not following right. you. And I love what you also said about not changing who you are. Right. right. It's this is who I am. It doesn't matter who I'm meeting. One that allows you to not worry about what did I say to that person or how did I treat right. that person? And the other thing for leaders, for those of you who are leading a team, listen to what Mike said, because I think it's spot on. I say it a different way. But what he said, he's not more important than anyone else. He just right. has different duties and responsibilities to make the whole machine move forward. But so does the detailer. So does right. the new person in the office, because if they don't do the job, the machine doesn't move forward. So no one's job is more important, but they all have to work together. He just has different responsibilities. So as a leader, you have different responsibilities, but that doesn't mean you're better. And right. I think that's so important because new leaders, new managers, they fall in love with the title and yeah. they think that's what's important instead of, well, would this person, would this group of people follow you if you didn't have the title? That's right. really the question you should be asking yourself. Right. And it's, it's not only, you know, that, but it's also being willing to put yourself in their shoes. So I'm willing to do any role in the company that comes up. And, you know, I start every question, you know, I'm talking to a detailer, can you do me a favor? Mm -hmm. And jokingly, some guys have said to me and said, well, what if I said no? I said, well, then I would do what I'm asking you to do, right? right. So that, like, if, if I'm not willing to go wash the car, if I'm not willing to go take a customer-facing position, if I'm not willing to go do paperwork, if I'm not willing to do all these different things, then how can I be expected? And how can I ask you to do that, right? So I think it has to be, there's a willingness to always put yourself in any place that the company's going to need you. And that also in return gets the respect because when they see you washing that car, like I've had employees say to me, Mike, you didn't have to take that car over and gas it up. Well, it needed done, right? So we were right. ready to do a delivery. I saw a need that you guys were busy. The salesperson's with the customer. You're getting paperwork ready. Nobody was gassing the car up. I'm doing nothing. Am I just going to stand there and point, hey, you do it? No, I'm going to insert myself and take care of whatever needs to be done. So that's the other part of it too, I think. Well, let me, so that leads me into a, a so another question pivoting a little yeah. bit. So as you grow, right, right, as you start, and it doesn't mean in your case, you've expanded to different locations, which we'll get to in a moment. Yeah. But even as you grow internally, that idea of, well, I see a need, I'm going to do that. Now, there are some dangers to that because there are people who will, as a leader, do someone else's job one. So, hey, listen, I saw a need. We have to get it done. We have to make sure it all works. But we have to be careful that, that de we don't create dependent people so they go, well, if I right. don't get to it, Michael, do my job. How do you find that balance of, in that case, of gassing the car up, I saw a need, but if there's a consistency to that, or you see this always happening, do you step back as a leader to then say, well, wait a minute, where is the breakdown in the process? Is somebody not know what's going on? Why do I find I have to do it? A one-off is fine, but I've seen people create dependent teams because they just want to help out almost 
helping out to a fault. Does that make sense? No, I think you hit it right on the head. I mean, I think that if you if you find yourself consistently inserting yourself into that process, then the, the process is broken, right? And, you know, I think that one of the hardest things for me to do throughout my career was, you know, delegate things out. You know, I always was the guy that came in on Sunday and moved cars, get ready for the snowstorm all by myself. And, you know, I've done, I, I've came in and packaged deals up on Sunday, you know, to get ready to be clean on Monday morning. And, you know, it was hard for me, you know, and, and that was where the level of trust and other people's integrity came into play. And I realized, you know, as I was going through that growth process, you know, when I, when it was, you know, nine years ago, it was me and two employees. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's very easy to handle. Either I'm doing it, you're doing it, or you're, you're doing it. Right? Right. It's not, it's not, it's not right. that hard. <laughs> you know, it's like, so, but as you grow and you're, you're, you're becoming overwhelmed with all those little things that you not, you don't necessarily need to insert yourself into, you have to learn to delegate that out. And that was one of the hardest things for me was just, you know, mentoring the people that were behind me. Uh, and to show them and to actually do one-on-ones with those and say like, this is how we handle this. And then to a point where I knew all those values and, and the things that, and the character of that person and the integrity of that person was suitable to handle those things and I could pass them on. And I'm still going to come back and check. I'm still going to come back and look to make sure, you know, I'm going to go and buy the lot and make sure all the holes are filled and make sure right. they're lined up properly and stickers are all done and the sticker on the back of the car looks nice and the lots. I don't have to do it anymore. I'm willing to do it. Right. And I've, I've gone in and said before, Hey, your lot's screwed up and I'll start moving cars. And then like, it goes back to, they don't want to disappoint me. Well, right. then I see a sense of disappointment that I, I, I gave them this responsibility. I mentored them in that responsibility. I set a level of expectation in that responsibility. And now I came back and it hasn't been handled properly. So maybe you have to retrain that and right. again. Right. So, and it, it, it's hard, you know, as from a leadership perspective to like elevate, you know, as you're growing, because, you know, you want to be in control of all those things that are underneath you, but there's no way to grow if you're still inserting yourself into all those, all those tasks. So it becomes that switch of now my task or my job is to inspect versus go right. do. And sometimes yeah, exactly. that's a hard thing to do, as you said, is... Well, I just have to get it done and hey, right. this isn't I'll jump in versus no, your job yeah. actually is now inspection, coaching, retraining more than right. getting in there and doing. And it's a lot easier to inspect, right? Mm-hmm. Than actually do it. And I, I've, I've said, you know, a lot of times I'll walk into one of my stores and I'll walk the lot and, you know, I'll notice very quickly a lot of things that are, are not right or they're out of place and i always say to those guys how can you guys be here for 10 hours right i'm here for five minutes and i can point out five things that need to be corrected but it's just the comfort of the the, them being in that everyday you know environment that they miss that stuff And, and sometimes it just has to be pointed out and reminded so the inspection part of it's a lot easier to do because i think someone can come in and assess the whole situation in five minutes 10 minutes versus being in the daily grind, you, you kind of lose sight of some. Of yeah, you things. stop seeing things. You stop right. seeing and someone just comes in and goes, why is that over there? And you go, oh, I've walked past it seven right. times and I didn't even notice it because yeah. there's other things going on. So to that point, then, yeah. let's talk about your expansion because you've had very, and you know, very proud of all the expansion and, and it's Thank really you. exciting. Yeah. How was that transition for you to... And I know there's people who are going to listen to this who are in the same situation where they've been put in responsibility. They they ran one store, so to speak. And now all of a sudden they have to oversee two. And I'm not saying owners, but that you could say ownership. But even right. if now I'm a general manager or an operations manager or a regional manager, and now I have three stores or two stores, how have you, in order to help them, what sort of things did you put in place to be able to be feel comfortable that things were going on well at the store that you were not at how did you you know going there you're right i'll go there for the day and we could tweak and train but when you leave all of a sudden i feel like it's spinning plates you know the old guy who on the poles would spin plates how do you 
check in on all your stores without having to be there and still feel things are going well? Well, I think it starts with the beginning of our conversation, you know, hiring the right people with those values and the character and the integrity and, and knowing that the integrity is there. And that all comes with trust, right? Mm -hmm. And I think also through through the hiring process, you know, a lot of times, you know, people try to you know dissect my hiring process. And I broke it down a little bit for you earlier. But the one thing I'm really looking for is extremely motivated people, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that I that that have that values, character, integrity. Because if you add that values, character, integrity. And you add motivation to that, mm -hmm. you're deadly, right? So now let me you ask know, you a question on that because some people will misunderstand motivation. Do you th do you yeah. look at it as like motivation because they've accomplished things? Like you look at somebody who maybe went was in the military or sports, or do you think motivation is has like a competitive edge to it? Is that what you? Think yeah, I think that, motivation. That I think on a, on a competitive side and an aspirational side. Oh, right? great. So I want to see great. that that aspirations uh there and i want and and, be, and when you have that when you have all four of those things you have values character integrity and the motivation and aspirations to to succeed you know that's someone i can trust to walk away from right that's someone that i can put in charge and i can walk away and then it's just a matter of you know following the numbers i get my reports daily right i get my contracts in transit daily I get my sales reports daily. I get my parts reports, my service hours. I get my, you know, Google reviews. I mean, I, I get like, I get a lot of stuff. I get my fresh trades report daily. I get, you know, a lot of reports that within 30, 40 minutes, I can spot a problem. And I don't really insert myself into every little problem. I, I try to prioritize my day based on those reports. So it might be a personnel problem. It might be a numbers problem. It might be a production, whatever it might be. But th that's where my, my, my focus daily is narrowed down to those critical tasks. And those are identified through those reports and through talking to people as far as personnel and stuff like that. And then I only come once in a while. So we, we need to have a one-on-one, -on -one, Glenn, because you know, we, we need, I need to understand why this is this and that's that, right? You know, but, you know, at, the, at, at its beginning, at its inception, I have to know that you were the right person. To, and that's all on me. You know, that trust that we've built between the two of us and, and allowed me to walk away. You know, that's on me. If I fail there and I didn't assess right. your values, character, integrity or motivation correctly, if that, that's all on me. And, I, and I'll take that if I, if I made the wrong decision. And quite frankly, and I'm not bragging, but I don't make that wrong decision. The people that are in the places that I have of, of, of control are there for a reason. They've proven themselves to me. Man. And when I say trust, you know, that's one thing I want to clarify is like trust to me. I tell this to my guys a lot of times. You can be an honest person that's not going to steal and not going to lie and not going to cheat. And that's one level of trust. I need to trust that you're going to do the right thing. Because my core values, you know, my principles that I, you know, the, the three top principles of, of this company are, you, you know, um, to number one is compliance. Mm -hmm. By all means, you better be compliant because we know the industry we're, we're in, right? So you have right. to be compliant. Number two is do the right thing. And number three is make money. And in that order. So make money is your last priority, right? So I have to trust that you are going to do the right thing. And look, everybody makes mistakes. And then sure. we can reevaluate if someone's going to make a mistake, mistake. But I need to have that trust that I know when I'm, you know, fishing off the coast of South Carolina and you're approached with a major issue, that you're going to do the right thing to handle that issue. So that that's where the trust, it's not just honesty and then, you know, that kind of thing. Right. It's but to you, so, so, so with that, let me, for, from a tactical yeah. standpoint, do you, so I have two questions. One, when you're, when you bring in someone or promoted that person to be in that position. Yes. If it's an internal promotion, I'm assuming they already know who you are and your caliber right. and what, what yeah. you're expecting. And, but do you spend time with them where you say, I'm going to spend 
you know, I'm spending the next two weeks with you and I'm just going to follow you around. So I know you're doing everything right. That, so that's one. And then the second one is when you're not there in that looking at a reports for, for those listening, did you create a structure where we have a phone call every single day, 15, 20 minutes mean we're going to hit these points. Tell me what's going on in the store. So I go, yep, that's a good plan. If you do that, we're in good shape. If you need me, call me. How do you work to communicate with those locations first to get that person ready to take on and then from a day to day? Yeah, I think, you know, early on in, in the company's evolution, I was hands on. I'm going to walk you through every mm -hmm. step and I'm going to watch you and I'm going to know that you're going to do things the right way before I pull, pull away. Pull away. As we've grown, that's not really practical for me anymore. So I have mm -hmm. to rely on that layer of management underneath me. Mm -hmm. And when I'm bringing that person in, you know, back to like hiring that person, I also, I'm never the, the sole decision maker on bringing anyone aboard. There's always pre-interviews, but by the time it gets to me, it's already been vetted. The right. If they if, if they're sitting in front of you, they've done it. If yeah. not, they wouldn't be in front of you. Right. So the, the individuals that presented that person to me are, will take responsibility kind of for, for that hands-on, you know, you know, indoctrination into our right. organization. Right. But, you know, once they're in that position, the way I handle, you know, I don't have scheduled calls. I don't have any of that. I really plan my day and I try to, you know, we have five stores right now I, and we have a corporate office. So we really have six locations and I try to be at at least two or three of those a day. And I take that opportunity, you know, because I know what my agenda is mm -hmm. and I know how, but I like to face to face, um, you know, talk with you and say, Hey, we need to handle this, this, and this, or what are we doing about this? And look, I'm always open for like, you know, healthy disagreement right <laughs> so it, it show me why I, i'm always open to like look why are we doing it this way or what's wrong here and i and i want that dialogue you know person to person eye to eye i want to talk it out and i think that's how i handle my issues and that's how i handle like the evolution of the company the changes that we're going to make because everything i do every move we make as a company I, I wear everything on my sleeves. I talk it out and I talk it out with a lot of people. And that comes from those one-on-ones and right. maybe one-on-twos. Like I'll pull two managers in and we'll have those, you know, 20, 30 minute discussions or 15 minutes, whatever it is. And that's how I really hit. I'm, I'm, I'm real hands-on in, in a management style of all my, you know, I always say I have 20 number twos. Right. <laughs> so right. That's that. Everyone's like, I want to be your number two. Well, that's pretty hard because I have 20 of them. Right. I don't have a number two. Maybe someday I should get a number two. I don't know. But because that's how tight that those relationships are. I have a very tight relationship with especially the top layer of management in the organization where they they I mean, we, we're texting back and forth. We're calling, we're talking, we're just, you know, we have more than just a working relationship. And I've built those relationships over the years. And as someone new comes in, you know, I try to establish that relationship. They want, I want a personal relationship with everybody in the company. I mean, detailers mm -hmm. text me. I mean, I have mechanics, I mean, you, you name it. People know they have a direct line to me and it keeps everybody honest too. Just on another point, as far as having a direct line, it does become overwhelming sometimes, you know, that they didn't go through their chain of command correctly. But I also want them to have that comfort that they have a direct line. If there's a problem, right. boom, hey, Mike, this isn't right. But back to your point about how, you know, do we get them indoctrinated into the company? I rely on a lot of my upper management to, to pull them along now that it's established. So so one of the other things I just heard, and, I, and as I said, folks listening, there's so much, I hope you go back and listen to it <laughs> times. There's yeah. so much rich stuff in here. But that idea of building an environment where those 20 number twos or most anybody one feels yeah. that they can talk to you. But I, what is really hard for a lot of new managers or even experienced managers is being humble enough to have a conversation, to be able to say, maybe I'm not right. You know, yeah. let's, let's talk about this because I've sat in rooms where there isn't that. It is right. a one-way dialogue, and then the disagreements are all amongst the number twos, but nobody's willing to go up to the top yeah. and say, this isn't working, this isn't right, you missed it. I think 
for me, same thing, having a few people, I, I've had times where I, I thought I gave a great meeting. I was like, that was awesome. And all of a sudden, someone who I trust dearly walks in and goes, how'd you feel about the meeting? I said, I thought it was great. He goes, you missed completely. <laughs> right. But you yeah. need that. But I think the great point that I don't want people to miss is being a leader being a really good leader, it has to have that humility that you don't have all the answers. You may have to make the final decision, yeah. but you need that input to build that trust because there may be something down the road that's really, really important. And you need to have that, those channels open. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm 100% you know, to allow for disagreement, not only allow for disagreement, but welcome it. Right. Right. And it's not only the dialogue of that disagreement that you yearn for, which will, which will promote growth, right? Because mm -hmm. that's where the biggest growth comes from. It's just like anything else that's painful. You go to the gym, it hurts. You're going to grow through that, right? Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's the same type of concept. And if you don't allow for disagreement and it's just, uh, you know, your way or the highway, I mean, you're, you're, you're not going to know when you're going the wrong way. And like right. I said, and welcome it like and let everyone know that you i want to hear your opinion right tell me why i'm wrong tell me how it makes better sense i've never considered myself and you know like the smartest guy in the room like no you're going to listen to me this is the way it's done i want to hear I, I i i pride myself in hiring people that i feel are more qualified than me in a lot of aspects mm -hmm. and the reason why i want to hire them and i and the reason why i look up to them is, is in their qualifications is because i want that discourse right i right. want that i want that dialogue and the other part of that is admitting when you're wrong right because there's so many leaders that like you know the, the, the ha, i told you so and you're like yeah right i know you did tell me and you are right and i was wrong and you have to have that you know you have to have that humility to, and look, we're all wrong. I don't care who you are. There's times in your life where, where you're off and someone needs to really point it out to you. And, you know, my wife who does our HR is probably the best example of that, right? She has no problem telling me when she thinks I'm wrong. And, right. I, and, and I've had a lot of growth through that over the years with her. And I welcome it from anybody. And I think- No, and I, I think to your point is that if you really think about it, anytime we learn, it's because we failed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You learn to walk by falling. You What's the same fail, fail forward. Is that the same? Yeah. That's what I always say. I always tell fail my forward. Team, I always tell them, please fail forward. Don't, if yeah. you land on your butt, wrong direction, fall on your face. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, yeah. But the other thing that I thought was interesting too, and, and to, to, to just add one thing to what you said is admit that you're wrong, but also being in the leader's chair is not always easy. It's not as glamorous as everyone thinks about right. it is. But if you get that input, there are times where you're not going to take their input, right? right? You know something maybe they don't know, or you just, I think it's just as important to explain why you didn't take their feedback or why we didn't no, use absolutely. your idea. Because if not, then you start going, well, they, because yeah. that could be a training. Here's something you didn't think about, because again, you're developing their leadership skills to eventually be in the position of making the decision you just made. They may not understand it. They may not have the experience you did. They don't yeah. understand the five other conversations you have. So take the time. If you're really going to build those people up, walk through your thought process, and then they go, oh, now I see why then they, exactly. you're, again, you're moving them a little further on their journey as well. You know, I think, look, clarity and communication, you know, and, and, and transparency, you know, are key and everyone has to understand your vision to, you know, like mm -hmm. and, and understand your thought process of how you landed, where you landed on that decision, you know, and it comes back to the trust factor. You know, if you have that clarity and you have that communication and you have that transparency and everyone completely understands your vision and they're aligned with it, they don't only understand it, but they're aligned with your vision. And that's how you get the loyalty that you're desiring from your employees. And, you know, who would want to work for a company 
and sit there and do data entry for eight, 10 hours a day and have no idea what the vision of that company was. Right. You know, have no idea what the aspirations of that company were and get no clarity or communications from anybody on absolutely why the, that's where you burn out. Because no, you, I agree. Because if that right? person, your example, that person, if they don't understand how their job fits into the success of others, how important what they're yeah. doing impacts your decisions, you know, having those reports done right on my desk allows me to do X, Y, Z. If right. you don't, then that person, to your point is they become in this bubble of not knowing why. And to your point, I think the other thing is the clarity and of the vision and all of that but then that next step of understanding what they have to do to deliver on that every single right. day. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. I remember dealing with a, I used to travel around and, you know, do the same thing, help, you know, these, these offices get better at what they're doing. And I would get feedback of, we don't know what to do every single day because the leader changes their mind every day and yeah. it's very inconsistent. And yeah. I thought about that. I said, who wants to come into a job every single day going, what mood is Mike in? Because if Mike's yeah. in this mood, or when Mike's here, we do it this way. When right. Glenn's here, we do it this way. And that's so, I think people want security, consistency yeah. in their job, feeling that what they're doing is important. And they feel that what they're doing is helping the team be successful. I think if we right. hit on all of those things on a, a, to structure it, give them feedback on it, I think then we can then I don't think people want to leave us. To your no, point. they don't want to leave. I mean, and that's what you strive for. You strive for building a, an environment where people don't want to leave. I always say people don't want to leave our company unless our company wants them to leave. Right. And that's what we're striving for. Right. And, you know, and, and to, to your point, the, the other part of that is the communication. I don't think there's a, such a thing as over communicating. Mm. My wife says I over communicate, but the reason being, because, if I do change my mind and I do veer a little bit, I want the communication of why I made that decision to be crystal clear. Right. Because I don't want everybody to anybody to ever think, well, this guy's, you know, one day he's over here, one day he's there, he's going to do this and he's going to do that. And, you know, it, you sound, you know, borderline, you know, crazy. So I, you, you have to, really have not just the clarity of the message, you know, and the vision, but yeah, it has to be extremely well communicated around everything. No, I think the danger, I think sometimes when people, and, and I'll make an assumption about what your wife was talking about, sometimes yeah. <laughs> over communication is micromanaging, meaning yeah. that you're constantly every day is Mike, don't forget this. Don't forget this. Don't forget yeah. this. Don't forget and this. It, yeah. That's, there's a difference. That's a there's, difference. No, there's a big I, difference. And and I don't micromanage, I back off. But when someone needs to know something, I'm gonna make sure everyone knows. It. No, and I think very, that very reinforce, yeah, reinforcing the vision, reinforcing what we're doing, why we're doing it. I don't think you can over communicate that right. enough. It's, but don't mistake that with, you know, getting involved to a point where I'm removing the trust from the person, right? right? That's a different conversation yeah. where I'm micromanaging, inserting myself, doubting what you're doing. I could say I trust you, but my actions don't trust you. Completely right. different thing. But I think to your point, over communicating the value, what we're trying to accomplish here, how we do it, you know, giving them feedback, yeah. good and bad. That's the way you win consistently. Yeah, exactly. That's how you build that dynasty. Um, listen, man, I could be talking to you all day. So um, good stuff. It is good stuff. So at the end of uh, every episode, we I throw right. out five random questions for you. All right, so, I'm ready. I'm scared. You ready? Scared. No, don't be scared. Don't be scared. <laughs> um, so this one I love asking people because it talks about right. your journey, right? You were in the Marines. You came up in the car business. Then you moved over to the vendor side, Westlake Financial. And now you're back. So looking through your life and who you are, yeah. if I go back to like, I have a six, 17 year old. So I, I love that sophomore, junior, there's such transition yeah. as, as that age. If you look back at that 16, 17 year old, Mike, right. what's consistent about you that you see that's still there always has been all the way through to you now. And then the other thing is if we could talk to that 16, 17 year old Mike, and he looked at you now, what's completely different. 
Wow. I'd say it's an easy, easy answer for me, man. Ambition, just sheer ambition has, it was, it was ingrained in me from the time I was delivering newspapers and mowing lawns and just trying to, to build something for myself and, and the independence that comes along with that ambition. And, you know, for me, um, money is nothing more than freedom and, and, you know, the independence that you create for yourself with making money. So I understood that at a very young age that, you know, as I tell a story all the time, I was, I think I was 12 years old and we were at Sears and my, there was a bicycle for 99 bucks. And I looked at my dad and I said, I'd like to get that bicycle. He said, I can't buy you the bicycle. And I reached in my pocket and I had, and I had the money. I said, well, I'm paying for it. And he just gave me a look. He gave me a look like he was just, where did like, but I had been mowing lawns and delivering right. and shoveling snow. And I saved my money. I was always good with money. So that the ambi- just the sheer ambition that I've had, um, it, it never changed. I'll take it to the grave. Um, and it, it doesn't have anything to do with money anymore. Now it's about growth. It's about providing opportunities for other people. It's it, mentoring people with that same ambition and showing them the path that they can take to achieve what they want to achieve. And that's what I really feel good about now at, at this stage of my life mm-hmm. is being able to reach my hand out to those other young Mike DeRazios, the, the next generations that, that's coming up and show them the proper way to go about it. Uh, and to your second question, what would I change? No, what was would, different? What was different? If they are looking at what would yeah. that 17 year old looking at you now going, God, I never thought I'd get there or whatever, you know, like completely different about you now. Well, I think humility, right? I think, you know, I'm, I'm a humble guy. I, you know, as I was a very arrogant, arrogant, entitled younger man. You know, I was going to conquer the world. You could not tell me and you couldn't get my, and I did, and don't get in my way. And I had no empathy for you if you did get in my way. Right. And I think that is what, you know, the Marine Corps kind of broke me of that um, business over the years, maturity, whatever you want to call it, just situations I've been through in life to really open my eyes up and be more humble um, to really, you know, embrace humility and, and, and have empathy. Like, Right now, I'm probably one of the most empathetic guys that you'll meet. And I had zero, zero when I was young. And it was just an evolution that I had to go through in my lifetime. But it's probably one of the most valuable lessons I've learned. I've said there's two major lessons that I've learned in my life man, over the years. It's, it, it, it's empathy and reticence. Knowing when to shut my mouth or knowing when not to run into the fight, run down the hill, knowing when to right. kind of sit back before I act because I was a very immediate action person. And I said what I wanted to say. I did what I wanted to do. And it hurt me in a lot of ways. And I had to mature through those two things to be reticent in my behavior and my speech and also to be empathetic to everybody else around me. So that, that's the best answer. That's a great answer. Um, <laughs> all right, number two. What do you, what are you listening to or reading or watching that is inspiring you to get better that you would recommend to the audience? Well, I think, you know, we're, we're on a clubhouse that inspires me every day. It just, you know, it kind of opened my eyes up to different perspectives all around the world from different parts of the industry, from vendors to dealers to GMs to GSMs to finance to BDC. You know, that's kind of what I'm listening to. I'm, I'm really in tune with a guy by the name of Andy Frisella. He's a business guy out yep. of St. Louis. Um, listening to him, I don't read much of his stuff. I think he already wrote one book. I did read it, but um, he's a very, similar minded person. Now, my wife actually turned me on to him because she listens to podcasts all the time. She said, you have, I've never, before him, I never listened to a podcast. And I said, she said, you have to listen to this guy. His name's Andy Frisella. And I said, why? She goes, he sounds like you. He talks like you. And I was like, oh, well, now, 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 really now you have me intrigued. right? Yeah. But he's a much more evolved version of me and a much more successful version of me also. But he's great to listen to. He's got a great mindset, you know, discipline and, and mental strength and all those things, grit and fortitude and all those things he talks about. It really just inspire me. 
and, and, and reading, you know, I, I've started to read over the last few years. I was, I was never a big reader, um, mm -hmm. but obviously, you know, good to great, you know, that that's probably one of my favorite books. I've read it like three times, um, you know, um, to think and grow rich. Is that the, the you know, yep, yep. Hill? Awesome. I've, I've read that twice. Uh, there's, there, there's a lot of stuff out there that I try to try to dabble in, but um, those are probably my two favorite. Perfect. All right. Next one is you said fishing off of South Carolina. Um, right. Tell me a place that you would love to travel yourself or taking the family that you haven't been to yet. Italy. You know, we were planning a trip to Italy on um 9 11 we were supposed to go that october uh, my wife and i and 9 11 happened and, and we didn't travel overseas and i would we were planning on going there this year i have um, some deep family roots there my grandmother her mother which my great grandmother that was from italy actually built a church in carpenone italy a small town in italy uh and then we from abruzzi we have uh, the derezio side of my family and from what I understand, from my uncles and my aunts and my grandfather told me stories, um, when you go back as an American, you're very welcomed and, and yes. re reconnect with your families from, from Italy. And that's something that's been a lifelong dream of mine that I have not done yet. And I'm hoping to knock that out sometime in late 2022. With my that's wife, great. So. Yeah, my brother, my brother did a... Uh, a lot of research into the family tree. He took that on, yeah. and, you know, my grandfather came over when he was young, you know, argued with his father. His father wanted him to be a shoemaker. He wanted to be a musician, became a very yeah. successful businessman here, had the largest music store in all of New Jersey. But when That's you went awesome. back there, what was great is I think one of the best things we did, my mother never had been able to go back there. My mother or father never went, but when he got remarried, he got married over there. We went over there and she was able to go to the town where her grand, her father was born and oh, went into awesome. that house that he was raised in because it was still in the family. And that was just, so I will tell you, yes, they welcome you, but it's just reconnecting with that is just yeah. so huge. And they want to show you, they want to take you around go, here's where this person went. Here's where this yeah. person went. It is. And for your kids, I will tell you, it will be so impactful for them yeah, to go as well. Um, okay. Two more, two more. Um, all right. If I took all of your close friends, people who really know you, really know you, put them in a room and said, describe Mike with one word. What's the one word they would use to describe you? Wow. I think um, ambitious because I really do. I mean, I go back to that consistent trait that I've had since I was a kid. And I think everyone that knows me knows that um, I just have this inner drive and sometimes I can't even comprehend what that drive is. Mm -hmm. um, my wife describes me as being uncomfortable when I'm comfortable. And it's just, I have to be, you know, challenging in some aspect of my life, whether it be, you know, through business, whether it's a physical challenge or mental challenge. All, I, I just have to, I have to make things hard on me and not hard. I don't look at it as making it hard on me. I look at it as, as accomplishing something. You know, when right. I had my first store, I got to the point where it was very successful and I had done all the things we talked about today where I, you know, I had built up the trust that I had in the individuals to run it. And I really would show up and I was like, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Because I had built this company and then I was bored. Right. And I had to challenge myself. And what I did with the second store, which is now Platinum Mitsubishi, um, it really put a heavy weight on me. And every time I do it, I say, well, geez, why did I do this to myself? But that's the process that I enjoy. It's not the end results. It's not the benefits and the money that everyone thinks that that's what you're chasing. No, I'm chasing the journey and trying to figure out what it takes. And every time I put myself under that crucible, right in that crucible, when I put myself voluntarily in there and I make it out in my mind, I'm smarter, I'm wiser, I'm better for it. And I can withstand a lot of things in the future. So that's what I desire. So it all boils back down to ambition. You know, and oh, I, I'm that, very that's ambitious. Great. 
That's great. All right. Last one. We talked about a lot of things here today. And yeah. again, I thank you for taking time. This has been great. Yeah, it was great. Um, Love it. If you hope the audience who listens will take one thing away from this, just one way from uh, one thing from our conversation, what would that yeah. one thing be? Wow. One thing. I think that um, being empathetic to fellow, your fellow humans, right? Not just your, your coworkers or people that work for you. Um, it's everybody. It's family members. It's that guy you see at this convenience store in front mm -hmm. of you. And it's just really trying to insert yourself into someone else's shoes all the time and approaching them in that respect. You know, um, you know, I always uh, look at people and, you know, I always think you know, in my, as far as the business side goes, when I'm talking to an individual, a detailer, a, a technician, a salesperson, a sales manager, general manager, whatever it might be, you know, I always talk to them and relate to them as I feel they would want to be related to. Hmm. Like if I was a technician, how would I want to be approached with this particular situation? And I really psychologically think and I try to be empathetic to them and, and speak to them the way that I feel if I was in that position, how would you speak? Right. You know, like, because like we, you go back to the detailer and you say, Hey, go, go do this. Is that really, if you were a detailer and someone came back to you and said, Hey, go do that. I told you to do that three times. Is that how you would really want to be spoken to? Right. No. right. You would want someone to come and say, Hey, Mike, um, I did ask you earlier to, can you help me out? I asked you earlier to clean that car. Would, would you go to do that now or in the next few minutes? That's a completely different way of getting the yes. same thing accomplished because you're empathetic to their particular situation and, 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 and how they operate. That's so great. if you could take one thing away, it's just in every walk of your life, have empathy uh, for everybody around you. Love that. Love that. Love that. Well, listen, Mike, thank you again. This has been phenomenal. Yeah. How can people connect with you? You know, again, if people want to pick your brain or just listen to uh, you, I mean, I know yeah. you're on Club Expo. How, how, where do they find you? Well, I mean, uh, of course, I'm on Facebook, Mike DeRazio. I'm on uh, Instagram as Mike E F F E N D, Mike F and D. That's a story for another day. That's my nickname. <laughs> um, I'm also on Twitter, Twitter as Mike F and D. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel, which is Platinum Ambition. That's M B I S H I N, Platinum Ambition. So we're, we're working on putting more content out there as a company. I don't like to make everything about me. Right. I, like to, I like to approach things as, as, as a company, uh, but we are putting a lot of more content out there. We have a new media company that we've been developing a lot more content. We're gonna get a lot more active with uh, YouTube and and uh, Instagram, the whole the whole nine yards. Great. TikTok, we're starting the TikTok campaign. Oh, TikTok and now. Yeah, so. and yeah, and we'll and we'll link up all of these in the yeah. show notes as well, so you can connect with Mike. So again, thank you, Mike. It has been thank an you. absolute pleasure. Audience, yeah. you know you know the drill. So please, there is someone out there in your network that can benefit from what Mike just shared. So please make sure you share this episode out. Please rate us. That helps the podcast grow as well as subscribe. We're out here every single week. That was the point of this. Our job is when you are sitting there and you say, I'm in charge, but now what the hell do I do? Well, every single week, we're going to be here with guests that are going to give you tactical things that help you so that you can develop into the leader that you want to be. So again, I appreciate your attention. I know there's a lot of places you can listen to content, but the fact that you spend time with Mike and me means the world. So again, thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you guys on the next episode. Mike, again, thank I'll you. see you soon. Thanks, Thank buddy. you, Glenn. Appreciate you, buddy. Bye Have bye. a good one. Thanks.